Uh, Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, uh, they're on that sheet. So then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, done by hand in the flesh. At that time you were without the Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise with no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. For he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh he did away with the law of the commandments in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross and put the hostility to death by it. When Christ came, he proclaimed the good news of peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The whole building is being fitted together in him and is growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, There's an outline on the inside of your uh, new sheet uh, there on the left-hand side. And there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Mum and Dad are visiting this afternoon, and uh, I'm really excited by that. It's always good to see Mum and Dad. And uh, they're coming because uh, they've been at Lightning Ridge for five weeks. They're running the church here for three months. I suspect they need to get out of the ridge uh, just to have a break for a night. Uh, It's been a bit of a cultural experience for them. I was sitting at my desk thinking the other day as I was preparing this sermon and remembering Uh, All the phrases that mum has used about me. You know how sometimes you'll sit and remember the phrases your parents use about you? Uh, Most of them weren't uttered in good circumstances. Uh, One that I seem to remember, I'm pretty sure this is the case. I have my doubts driving over from the West, but I'm pretty sure uh, she says she never said it. But every now and again, she'd just throw her hands up in frustration and say, Bernard, all your culture is between your toes. (laughs) I suspect she was right at the time she said it. Uh, But we're talking about culture today, a very different and more profound culture. Uh, I want to define culture in this way. It's the man-made way we do things around here. The man-made way we do things around here. We're fascinated by culture. I suspect that's because we're products of culture in so many ways. We want to know what makes a culture, what defines a culture, why we use a culture, what cultures succeed. Uh, Even as we move into the grand final period of all the major footy codes, culture dominates as journalists and fans and rival coaches try to work out why have they got a winning culture and we don't. The Rugby World Cup kicked off uh, over over this weekend and as I was thinking to ABC Grandstand yesterday, most of the discussion was about culture. Uh, How can a nation of so few people New Zealand, generate a rugby culture that just seems dominant all the time. What's their secret? Culture fascinates us. And Paul's turning to culture now in this next section of Ephesians. And it's the culture of the community of God's people. And it offers everything our world wants in a culture. Everything our world yearns for, desires and finds attractive. And it's here in this community. Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Father, as we sit here today with many things on our hearts and minds, remove them if they are distractions by your Holy Spirit. If we sit here apathetic to the power of the sword of your word, please sharpen it by your spirit. If we sit here worried about this world, please reassure us by your word. If we sit here lacking peace and feeling outside, please reassure us and bring us in by your word. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Uh, Paul was transformed when he met Jesus. We know that. His identity was radically changed from a murderer to a proclaimer of Jesus Christ. He's now under house arrest in Rome, 60 to 62 AD. Joined to a group of Christians in modern day Turkey, a town of Ephesus, quarter of a million people. Lived there for a number of years, helped establish a church. <coughs> he hasn't been there for over seven years and there's been the natural turnover you have in a port community with the church. He's writing to that community and uh, that community of Christians is made up of Jews and non-Jews. We'll come to that in a second. They've got competing pressures on their identity. There's a temple up on the hill put there by the local Greeks. There's the coins in their wallet with the image of the emperor. And then there's this Christianity and their birth culture, all of them competing. And he wants to write to them and reassure them, remind them of their identity. It's connected inseparably to the plans of God, to the plan of God from the beginning of time to bring everything in the universe to right order through a bloke called Jesus. Now, last week we saw what that looked like vertically. We saw what happens when God does something for his enemies who are rebellious corpses. Remember corpses? And he raises them to life. He makes them appropriate for sitting at his dinner table. He does it all through Jesus by his abundant grace through faith. Remember the change in the walking, from walking in our sins and trespasses to walking in good deeds. That's the vertical. But it has a horizontal impact. It affects relationships amongst people, especially those connected to Jesus and Paul is turning to that now. And before we look at what he says initially in verses 11 to 13, I'm at point two on the outline, we need to remember the situation in Ephesus. I've hinted at it again, a large cosmopolitan port, a significant town, melting pot of cultures. Uh, there's the temple to Artemis up there on the hill, the Greeks. There are the coins that bear the image of the Roman emperor, the one who brought peace, who defines time. And then there are, there are the Jews and then there are all the other nationalities. Now, from God's perspective, there are only two groups, aren't there? There are Jews and there are non-Jews. There are Jews and there are Gentiles. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Jews are the nation of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, and everyone else is a Gentile. Now, God's chosen those people for a reason. He's chosen them to be his representatives to the world. Exodus 19 verses 1 to 8. To be his priests that stand between him and all humanity in order to represent him faithfully to the world. To say, look, this God will roll back the curse. This God will deal with sin. And so he gives them a number of markers. That's the purpose of the Ten Commandments, so they know what it means to look like him, to represent him faithfully. Uh, the markers don't make them God's people. Remember, they're already saved. But the markers help them represent God to the people. So if you're in Ephesus and you want to meet God, where do you go? You go to that mob because they represent God. But to be blunt, they failed, didn't they? Dismally. I meant to represent God's name to the world. Instead, they dragged it through the mud. They meant to introduce people to God, but they actually kept, him away, kept them away. They meant to be a blessing to the universe, but they kept the rest of the universe away from God. And I think in large part they failed because they actually misused God's revelation to them. What he gave them wasn't used to introduce people to God, but to keep people away from God, to build a barrier, a wall, an obstacle. And it's against that backdrop that Paul writes to God's community in verse 11. <coughs> so then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, done by hand in the flesh. That's the background to what Paul is saying there in verse 11. He wants both parts of God's people, those who've come from the nation of Israel and those who haven't, to hear those words, to recognise those words, to understand what's going on. You see, the Jews are on the inside. The Gentiles are on the outside. 
The Jews have failed in their job and the Gentiles have suffered the consequences. It's almost like in the playground of the world. What was a mark of representing God? Circumcision became an insult that you used to keep people out. To say we're in and you're not. And you see the consequence there in the description in verse 12? At that time you were without the Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, with no hope and without God in the world. Without God in the world. Uh, One of my great fears growing up was getting lost from my parents or losing my parents. I managed to do it in my very own house and I traipsed down the street to the police station who then found mum and dad in the house I'd just walked out of. But my great fear was that I'd lose them and I'd lose them because I bore their image. That was my family. Can you imagine bearing the image of God and then being without him? The Gentiles need to remember that. Do not forget it. Do not forget what you were. The Jews need to remember that. Do not forget what has happened. And together they've got to remember that because of this misuse, and that's what it is, we'll see that in a moment, of what God has designed, there is a fundamental, a violent and excluding division amongst humans. And that's not God's design. But something has taken place. Look look there in verse 13. But now, there's that but, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. You see, uh, some people have summarised the failure of the Jews as a misuse of blood. You don't have the right blood. So you're on the outside. I got the right blood. I'm on the inside. Do you see how God changes that? He changes that with blood, doesn't he? The perfect blood. The blood of a bloke called Jesus whose blood was shed to bring the outsiders in. How does that take place? What's the engine that drives that? Oh, that's really verses 14 to 17. Uh, Point three of the outline. Look, Look there in verse 14. For he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. He did away with the law of the commandments in regulations. Jesus has brought peace. It's worthwhile sitting down and working out uh, how many resources humans spend on peace. We did it at youth group just briefly. I mean, everything from the United Nations to the sandpit in kindergarten. They're all about peace, really. We spend enormous resources on peace and yet here's a bloke who's brought it. In his life, death and resurrection, bringing two groups who have been excluded from each other, who hate each other and brought them together to be one. He's done it vertically between humans and God and then within God's people, within God's mob, it achieves something that's unique. Did you see the three phrases there in verse 14? And 15, a double underline, they mirror each other, they work in parallel and at the heart of it is what Jesus has done that the Jews didn't. Remember Matthew 5, 17 to 20, he fulfilled the law, he represented God as he should be known and so he removes the division that's been built up. Uh, Firstly, he makes the two groups one. That's a definition of peace. We like to think peace is what's happening in North and South Korea, really. They're not shooting. That's a win. That's not peace, is it? That's just not shooting. You see, peace isn't when hostilities cease. It's not the removal of weapons. It's not the end of division. It's when two enemies become one person. That's peace. That's peace. And he did that, secondly, when he tore down the dividing wall of hostility when he removed the division between those two groups, the Jews and the Gentiles. We did a brief survey at youth group. It was slightly disheartening to realise that amongst the people at youth group, there were really only three people alive when the Berlin Wall was torn down. Made me feel a little old. It's not why I got their hair cut. But that was a marvellous, a marvellous demonstration, wasn't it? 
when something that had been set up was torn down with bare hands so that one nation could result. And the barrier being talked about here is the misuse of the commands of God. You see, they hadn't been used to reveal God to the world. Instead, they'd been used to keep the world from God. And that destruction of that wall happens there. Do you see in verse 15? In, in his flesh, he did away with the law of the commandments in regulations. He actually does what the commandments intended and what they were misused for. He reveals God. So he does away with it. So any human being can come and meet God if they come and meet Jesus. He did it because human beings couldn't. He did it because human beings were corpses. He did it by living the life that every human could never live. He did it so that on the cross, through the cross, the judgment for all of that wall building and rebellion and sin could be laid on him. And so that means that any human being can now be reconciled to God. Any human being. Any human being who at nature and heart rebels against God, can now be reconciled to God. And that means all those who are reconciled to God are reconciled to each other, are all alike in sin, all saved by the same Saviour and all restored. So there's no division. Did you see the repeated result of that through those verses, 14 through 16? Two become one, two become one, two become one. It's like a drumbeat of a community, isn't it? Two become one, two become one. So there's peace between humans and God, but then within God's people, what is there? There's peace. There's no Jew or Gentile. There's just saved sinner. Jesus did that so that, verse 16, he might not just reconcile both to God, but reconcile both to each other to put the hostility to death by it. Is it a secret? No, it's not. It's always God's plan. Genesis 12, 1 to 3, remember that? I'll bring blessing to the world. I'll roll back that curse. So verse 17, when Christ came, he proclaimed the good news of peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. God is very clear about this. I think it's worth pausing at that moment, isn't it? And just thinking and grasping what has been done in one man. Remember as Neil talked to us about the prayer of Paul and at the heart of that was the demonstration of the power of God working. This is the power of God working, isn't it? Uh, Applied vertically between people and God, applied horizontally. So the corpses can now sit at the dinner table, acceptable to God, so we can know him. And humans reconciled to each other in such a way that there is now no division. None of the divisions that we so naturally create amongst ourselves. And at the heart of it is the work of God's power. So that any sinful human being can be saved by the one saviour by taking God at his word so that they are stripped down to equality within the people of God. Saved sinner. Isn't that a marvellous truth? A marvellous possibility? A marvellous reality? In fact, it's actually at the heart of a marvellous culture. It's a culture of access, verse 18. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Most cultures are about keeping people out. This is a culture about bringing people in. Uh, There's a community just even within that verse. Did you notice that? The community of the Trinity, because there they all are in verse 18, working together, Father, Son and Spirit. But now any human being can come to God and say, Father. And then that actually creates a description of God's people, verse 19. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of God's household, 
build on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The whole building is being fitted together in him and is growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. That's a remarkable change from verse 12, isn't it? Excluded, included, foreigners, fellow citizens, no hope, access to the Father, no God, part of the household. Where? All in that postcode called in Jesus. Not the postcode of Ephesus. In Jesus. And did you notice how marvellous those images are? I think one of the loveliest things is to see it in a household that's working well, isn't it? Around the dinner table, sharing a meal. That's what this is. It's a household. God's household. A nation. A people. Citizenship with one foundation. Everything God has said with one cornerstone so there are no wonky angles. Jesus Christ himself. Not a stagnant or a static household but a growing one being changed and revealed and consumed and constructed into a dwelling place for God. Have you thought about that as what we're doing now? If someone was to walk in here from Narrabri, they would meet God in this group. And at the heart of that community, there is a complete equality and unity and one identity. One postcode in Christ. Now for a town like Ephesus, cosmopolitan port, that's a revolutionary truth, isn't it? The key divisions of a man-made culture are wiped away in God's mob. Jew, Gentile, Roman, non-Roman, slave, free. Every man-made division is removed. There is one postcode, one identity, God's people. In Christ. That's a revolutionary culture, isn't it? An attractive culture, a freeing culture, a unique culture. But it's also a culture that poses some very pointed questions, doesn't it? Rwanda was widely regarded as the most Christianised of the African nation states in the 90s. Statistics variously put the percentage of Christians at 80%. That hit a reality that was widely known in the country, but we only found out in 1994, didn't we? In a country which was ethnically divided between the Hutu majority and the Tutsi minority, the genocide of 1994 revealed the way in which an ethnic identity dominated. In the dominant church, from the bishops to the parish level, there was participation in the slaughter of the Tutsi. Parish leaders oversaw the killing of their own parishioners in their own church buildings, at their own hands, because his neck and his nose were different. Ethnic identity trumped any form of unity in the people of God. Now, Rwanda was predominantly Catholic, but you only have to move to the bottom of that continent to see what the Protestant church can do. Where the history of South Africa and the Dutch Reformed Church and the Anglican Church provided the theological framework for apartheid. Where the fact that his skin colour meant he was an outsider and less than human. There are some pointed questions this culture raises for us, aren't there? Questions about culture and who we are. And that's the first question we've got to deal with. Remember how we define culture? It's the man-made way our group does things. It creates our history, our way of communicating, our collective memory. And when we join God's people... When God takes us from corpses to dinner guests, our culture changes. We have a new primary culture, a new identity that trumps all others. 
I am a privileged white Anglo-Saxon male who has a tertiary education, who's grown up in an Anglican household, but I am in Christ. Now, hear me carefully. I'm not saying culture is wiped out. That's the picture of Revelation 7. But we now have a new primary culture, don't we? A culture to which everything must be submitted. A culture which is revealed in the apostles and the prophets and that cornerstone. It doesn't remove our earthly cultural identity, but it gives us an eternal one that is primary. And so whenever we meet as a cultural group, and we do, it must be passed through that postcode, mustn't it, in Christ? What do we do? Why do we do it? Where does it come from? And the second question that is asked of us is the question of racism. Now let me be very clear. There should be no hint of racism within the community called God's people, should there? No hint of racism. No hint of the discrimination against someone in any form because of their ethnic background, either conscious or unconscious. And we often do both. It has no place in the people of God. We are one group because we are all sinners saved by the one saviour, which means every other ism has no place, does it? Blue collarism, white collarism, where we've grown up, our education, our employment situation, our social class, our age. Those divisions have no place amongst God's people. There is no group more privileged. There is no group less privileged. Because remember, for through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Which leads to the final point. If that is true, if that is true, then we have something worth proclaiming, don't we? We have a postcode that is the most desirable postcode in the whole universe. The one postcode that brings peace, that brings complete unity, that brings reconciliation in every sense of that word between people and God and amongst people. When we've experienced that change in postcode, we must proclaim it, mustn't we? In Christ, in this community alone, is the true peace of reconciliation, isn't it? And we must proclaim it. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way in which this passage acts as a sandblaster or a piece of sandpaper or as a gentle wipe clean. Father, please work it into our hearts and souls. Please, by your spirit, transform us as a community, a community where there is one culture in Christ Jesus, where there is true peace and where we exist in true unity. In Jesus' name, amen.